So today we're talking about hybridization. Um, the definition of hybridization is the mixing of atomic orbitals to make new hybrid orbitals of new energy and shape suitable for chemical bonding. So for instance, if we have methane, that's my go-to compound, we never really talk about, or have, up, have not up to this point talked about what orbitals participate in that single bond, or what orbitals, orbitals participate in that bond. So today we're going to learn what carbon does, as well as what something like hydrogen would do in creating those single bonds. And then we'll talk about some double and triple bonds as well. So. Um, we're going to come back to this page once we talk a little bit about the bonding. The first thing I want to look at is um, the actual hybridization portion of this. So I'm going to start with the family tetrahedral, because that's the one that's the easiest to grasp. So if something has a tetrahedral electronic structure, we know that there are four areas around the central atom. Um, in order to bond, atoms must utilize electrons from valence orbitals. So unless we're talking about hydrogen and helium, everything else has 1s and 3ps available for bonding because that's how many valence orbitals there are, and those contain the valence electrons. Well, when we're in a tetrahedral electronic structure, we know we have four areas. What happens? To create four different areas, we're going to utilize all four of those valence orbitals. Those orbitals are placed, I'm, I'm making up a punch bowl analogy here, throw them in a punch bowl, mix them up, and when you do, you get four brand new hybrid orbitals that all have the name sp3, 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 and sp3. We need four orbitals to make four different areas. Now, each of these sp3s are the exact same in energy. Unlike here, we have a low energy and three high energy orbitals. We've created a hybrid, which is kind of an average of all of those that we um, put into the punch bowl. So what it looks like is each one of these orbitals around something with four areas, again, like CH4, would be the same energy orbital called sp3, and there's four of them. I don't want you thinking it's an s and a p and a p and a p. Uh-uh, that's not what it is. There are four separate orbitals, each with the name sp3. And you can see where tetrahedral gets its shape. Those sp3 orbitals naturally fall that distance apart, 109.5 degrees. So if we move on now to something with three areas or a trigonal planar electronic structure, we still have the same four orbitals available, but because we need three areas, we're only going to use up three of those orbitals. Mix those up, and we get three new hybrid orbitals of average energy, each one called sp2. So this is an sp2, this is an sp2. Why is it called sp2? Because it's made up of an s and two p's. So sp2 orbitals are about 120 apart, and that's where trigonal planar gets its shape. So what's that other black dumbbell that you see? Right here, this thing that I'm circling in blue, is the unused p orbital, because we only use two of the p's. So this is an unhybridized p. You're going to see pretty quickly um, what that p does. It's actually going to wreak a little havoc on the system and want to be involved in bonding. But for now, just know that if you have three areas 
anywhere in the electronic structure of 3, you're going to have hybridization of sp2. So with that being said, if we have the need for two areas with something like this, we got our carbon dioxide there. If we have two areas, we're going to need to use two of the orbitals, mix them up, and we get two brand new orbitals, each called sp, leaving us with two unhybridized p orbitals. And here they are. There's one. And then here is the other. Again, this kind of looks like it's four orbitals, but it's not. It's one p and one p. I don't want you to think those are four p orbitals. It's just long lobes. So we have an sp, an sp, a p, and a p. So if you have two areas for a linear electronic structure, the hybridization is sp. So now what we can do is go to the table. Let's go back to the table a little bit. I think it's here. And let's fill in our hybridization. So we know if we have two areas, it's sp. If we have three areas, it's sp3. The three is a superscript, just like an electron configuration. So anything with three areas is sp. Oops, and I messed up. It's sp2, not sp3. sp2, sp2. If we have four areas, it's sp3, sp3, sp3. So we can assume with five, since there's an expanded octet, we're going to have to find a fifth orbital. And where we find that fifth orbital from is the Ds. So we end up making five different orbitals, each with the name sp3d. So anything that has five is going to be sp3d. And then you can just guess that if you need six areas, we need an additional D, so we get sp3d2 for all of these. So now let's look at some structures and we can apply this knowledge. Um, I have some little structures here. Just for time's sake, these are all exceptions. The available electrons in this picture was 22. After drawing it, the central atom looks like this, and the whole thing is negatively charged. I'm not drawing the peripheral Fs just for time, but the question is, what's the hybridization and the geometry? So we're looking for the hybridization and the shape in space. This has one, two, one, two, three, four, five areas, so the hybridization is sp3d. That makes this linear. It's trigonal bipyramidal electronically, but geometrically in space it's linear. Let's go to B, this OSF4 business. If we have our S in the middle, because it's the least electronegative, four Fs. And um, this has an availability of 48 electrons. So when you fill it up, all the Fs and Os and everything, that's what you get. So here is um, five again. So we're still SP3D, but this is actually geometrically trigonal by pyramidal. SIF6 is an SI with 48 electrons available. So when you place them all and you have all your Fs and fill all the Fs up, your central atom is just six bonds. And with the six bonds, we end up getting octahedral electronically with an sp3d2 hybridization. In a little organic compound like this, we know that each C has to have four bonds, so that means we need a triple here. What we can do in a case like this, since there's truly no central atom, we're going to look at the hybridization of each C individually. This little guy has two areas, so that's SP hybridization. This little guy has also two areas, so he's undergoing SP hybridization. And both of these two areas, we have a linear situation in both of those cases. So now I want to go on to actual bonding, what kinds of bonds occur in compounds. So now we know what orbitals will overlap in compounds. What we need to now see is how they overlap and what kind of bond they make. So there's two types of bonds you're going to be responsible for, a sigma bond and a pi bond. 
Anytime you see a single bond on a Lewis dot structure, like, again, like this, a single bond is a sigma bond. There's free rotation, so you'll notice if you look at molecular models that you can rotate around those bonds without breaking the bonds. And these are characterized by how they overlap, just head-to-head, head -head, bam, overlap, sitting right next to each other. Any orbitals can overlap in a sigma bond. We can have an S orbital overlapping with an S. We can have an SP2 overlapping with an SP3D2. It doesn't matter what orbitals we're talking about. The fact that they overlap head to head means that it is a sigma bond. Now, if you're looking for a pi bond, pi bonds are only made by unhybridized P's. Unhybridized P's will sideways overlap and create what we call a bi bond, a pi bond. Um, pi bonds are found in double and triple bonds, and what's interesting about those is you cannot rotate around those without breaking the double bond, and you'll see in model kits that as well. Um, you do need to know that anytime you have a double bond in a Lewis dot structure, it's going to consist of a sigma and a pi. And if you have a triple bond, you've got a sigma and two pi's. And again, I already mentioned that single bonds are sigma bonds. A lot of instructors will just make you memorize this. I don't like doing that. I want to explain to you why this happens. So the drawings I'm about to show you, you're not going to be responsible for drawing. You're going to just hopefully understand them enough to help make determining sigma and pi bonds more meaningful. So let's take a look at the bonding in ethane. We know ethane looks like this. So ethane has two Cs. So I'm going to um, now draw out the orbitals here. The orbital on the left, uh, the, the carbon on the left, excuse me, I'm looking at this guy, has a hybridization of four areas, so it's sp3. So that means there are four different orbitals each with the name sp3. So I'm drawing those in. Okay. And the other carbon, notice, same hybridization, four areas around it, each with the same sp3 notation. So we've got one, two, three, four different orbitals also named sp3. Notice here, the sp3 orbital just head-to-head -head overlapped with another sp3 orbital. That makes this a sigma bond. And you can see that it is definitely a single bond. Now what about all those hydrogens? Hydrogen does not undergo hybridization. Why? Hydrogen has, got, has just one electron, right? And that one electron is a first-level electron, and the only orbital on the first level is an s. So there are no orbitals to throw in a punch bowl on the first level. It's just the s. So the s orbital of each hydrogen is going to head-to-head -to -head overlap with all the sp3 orbitals from our carbons. So now we have made an additional six sigma bonds. Every single one of these is a sigma, 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 sigma. So here we have seven six from the hydrogens and one from here, a total of seven sigma bonds in this picture. And that's something you're responsible for finding out. Did you have to draw this whole thing to understand that? No. Looking at the picture, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven single bonds, and that means we have seven sigma bonds. So moving on, let's talk a little bit about ethene. Ethene's a little different because it has a double bond. Because it's a double bond and our number of areas have decreased since the last molecule, then we are going to have a different hybridization. So let's draw this one out. <clears throat> draw it in green. C, C. Since each of these carbons has three areas around it, this one has three and this one has three, we are going to know that the hybridization of each of these is sp2. So that means around each of these guys are three sp2 orbitals. We have an sp2, and there's 120 apart, sp2. This guy's sp2 overlaps there. Oh, there's a sigma bond. 
All right. So here we have a sigma bond. But we can't forget something. Remember, because we're sp2 hybridized, we have one unhybridized p. Where is that? Bam, right there. There's an unhybridized p on each of these carbons, because we only used up three for each. So what's going to happen, we're going to have a sideways overlap. These guys are going to kind of bend and stretch and overlap top lobe to top lobe, bottom lobe to bottom lobe. And I'm going to kind of draw what that's going to look like, sort of. And we end up getting, whoa, this back. We end up getting this. So there is a sideways overlap of unhybridized peas, and that is a pi bond. So within this double bond here, we have one sigma and one pi. Now what about the um, H's? Remember, they don't hybridize, so their little s orbitals are just going to sigma bond with the sp2 orbitals from our carbons. So looking at this picture, we have one, two, three, four, five sigmas and one pi. Yep, and if you count, one, two, three, four singles, a double bond is a sigma and a pi. So that's six pies, six sigmas and one pi. The last one we'll look at is ethyne. I want you to see ethyne and realize how that works. So ethyne is constituted with a trip. What makes it different is it's got a triple bond. So that gives each of these guys two areas. So the hybridization around both of those is just two orbitals, each with an S name. So we've got this, we've got this. This has two SPs coming off of it. This has two SPs coming off of it. And these guys are 180 apart, so we know this is going to be a linear molecule. Since they're 180 apart, that looks like a smiley face with eyes, doesn't it? Um, okay, so now we have to remember, of the three Ps available, we only utilized how many? One of them. So we need two that are going to be there unhybridized. So I have some in the x direction, and I'm kind of trying to put some in the z direction. It's hard to do it two-dimensionally. So now I've got these unhybridized p's. What are they going to do? Yes, they're going to overlap. The, thing, the orbitals in the same direction will overlap with the orbitals in the same direction on the other molecule. So these orbitals will overlap with these guys. And this orbital will overlap with this guy. That was horrible. Anyway, that's really hard to see. Um, for those of you at home, those in class, I'm passing models around, so they'll be able to see it more clearly. But basically, you've got like two donuts running through the center of the molecule, each of those donuts being a pi. So we have a green pi, we have a red pi, and then we have our blue sigma constituting the triple bond in the middle of the structure. Then we have our two sigma s, s orbital overlap the sp, so we got a sigma here, a sigma, and a sigma. So in this picture, we have a total of three sigmas and one pi. Remember, single bond is a sigma, double bond is the sigma, and a triple bond is a sigma and a pi and a pi. Did I say double bond was a sigma? Let's go back. Single bond is a sigma, double bond is a sigma pi, triple bond is a sigma pi and a pi. So looking at a molecule like this, oftentimes you'll be asked multiple questions. So we're just going to do this problem so I can show you how it works. But um, you take a large molecule, and you're going to look at atoms individually, and you're going to figure out um, anything you're asked about those, like bond angle, like polarity, like hybridization, like structure ge geometry, that kind of thing. So it says, where are the, what are the bond angles around each of the two carbons, and what are the hybridizations of the orbitals of each of them? So the first carbon, the second carbon. The first carbon, if you look, it has four areas. So the hybridization is sp3, and that um, bond angle would be 109.5 because all of those are bonded areas. And the next C, 
we have a hybridization based on three areas, so it's SP2, and the bond angles are 120 because they're all, and I'm writing degrees Celsius. This shows you how, how tired I am. It's just degrees. All right. What are the hybridizations of the orbitals on the two oxygens and nitrogen atoms? Um, so our oxygen and our oxygen. We're going to take a look at the, the top oxygen first. I know it's hard to see, but that oxygen has three areas. It's got two lone pairs, and it's got a double bond. So that's three areas. The um, hybridization of three is sp2. And they're asking for bond angles. Anything that's terminal like that with just a bond coming off of it has to be linear. So it's not related to the number of areas. So don't call it some other um, random bond angle. It's, it's 180 degrees away from what's next to it, because it's only attached to one thing. However, that other oxygen we can talk a little bit more detail about. This other oxygen, call it green, it has four areas. So the four areas makes it an sp3 hybridization. The bond angle, though, it's four areas, but it's not 109.5 because there's two lone pairs. That makes it less than 109.5. I don't know if you remember from class, that was about 104 degrees. And then the nitrogen. Adam, what are the approximate bond angles about the nitrogen? Here, you've got to really be careful. A lot of students will say, oh, it's just three areas, but it's actually four because this nitrogen is attached to a C, it has a lone pair, and it's bonded to two H's. So that's actually four areas. Four areas has a hybridization of SP3, and the bond angle, because there's one lone pair, is less than 109.5. It's about 107. So the last thing you'll have to do in a problem is to determine the number of sigma and pi bonds. Luckily, you don't have to do all that drawing that I did on the last two slides. All you have to do is count single bonds and double bonds and triple bonds. So here we have 1, 2 for those hydrogens, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, in a double bond, we have one sigma, so that's nine. We have nine sigma bonds. And because it's a double bond right there, we also have a pi. So nine sigma and one pi in that molecule. That's going to be a common problem, is just to count pi's and sigma's. So here, I don't want to do any more of the bond angles and stuff, but I do want to quickly do hybridization of each of these. All right, so the first one, sp3, because there's four areas, three areas, sp2, four areas, sp3, four areas, sp3. And that, in a nutshell, is hybridization.